Welcome to the Men of Iron podcast, changing a culture one man at a time. At Men of Iron, we equip men and grow godly leaders through creating and sustaining one-to-one and micro-group mentorships. Go to menofiron.org for more info. Thanks for listening. The heart of the mentor is, is, is the first thing. you got to have a guy who really loves other people. Every, every month before my meeting, I, say, I pray and I say, Lord, what would you have me know about tonight? And every month the same message comes through. Reggie, just love them. Welcome to the Men of Iron podcast. It's Steve and Garrett live from the Men of Iron headquarters. G, how you doing today, man? Uh, it's raining hard outside. It's a little muggy, but uh, we're doing good, man. We're in the land of milk and honey. You That's know right. I mean? We're uh, nice and safe inside. we got an awesome, awesome show today. We're excited for our special guest. Episode 40 is brought to you by you. We are looking for your business organization, organization or brand to be the next Men of Iron podcast sponsor. Go to menofiron.org backslash sponsor for more info. Yeah, and thank you to everybody that has, you know, sponsored this thing up to this point and uh, all of our donors and organizations that believe in what we're doing. We're very grateful for uh, everybody's buy into our mission and vision. We're very grateful, so thank you. So, yeah, hit the link if you want to find out more information and sign up to be the next sponsor for the Men of Iron podcast. We are thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Reggie Campbell. Reggie is an entrepreneur, speaker, and author and is the founder of Radical Mentoring, an intentional small group mentoring process to help engage men and transform the church. Reggie has been married to his wife, Miriam, for 49 years. They have two kids and five grandchildren and currently reside in Atlanta, Georgia. Reggie, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. We're thrilled to have you, man. What's going on down there in Atlanta, Georgia? It's hot as the devil down here. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, the air is so thick, you can cut it with a knife. Um, that's cloudy, but um, hey, you know, the sun's always shining on the inside, right? Hey, when us Northeasterners complain about the heat, you guys in the South probably just laugh at us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love for you to just tell the listeners and viewers just who is Reggie Campbell. Well, I uh, I think you 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 hit some of it, um, probably the best parts. I'm a I'm a business guy. I haven't been to seminary. I. Uh, uh, Jesus found me when I was 33 years old. I'd been a business guy with AT&T and, in the first part of my career. Got married in, in college. Uh, left AT&T after 13 years. Started uh, my own business after Jesus found me and turned me around. I uh, became serious about my faith and started... Uh, actually, my wife and I worked with singles for 15 years and, and uh, at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church. And then we went to North Point when it started. Uh, along the way, we had two kids. They've now grown up and given us five grandchildren, and uh, they're uh, they're they've married well. They're all uh, Jesus followers, and we're just excited about that. I am um, I'm kind of a a walking miracle in a sense. I've had a bunch of different health issues, and I'm breathing through somebody else's lung right now. I had a lung transplant three and a half years ago, wow. and so uh, I'm still here. I don't know for how long, but I'm still here. And I love Jesus, and I love uh, investing in men. So that's about all you need to know. Awesome. Well, I, well, I read somewhere as, as we were preparing for this, somebody, I uh, can't remember who it was, but called you the master mentor. So we are excited to learn from the master mentor today. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure, Reggie. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. That's a low bar, right? <laughs> All right, but before we get into it, Reggie, we're going to hit you with take five, just five fun questions, a little bit of an icebreaker. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, take five, question number one. Give us one of your favorite hobbies and why you enjoy it so much. I uh, make a music video for every grandchild every year. I take all the pictures and videos that I and their parents shoot. Hmm. I find a song that sort of speaks to who they are or how I see them or how I hope I will see them someday. Put all those pictures and videos to that song and unveil it at Christmas for each one. Wow, that's phenomenal. Uh, it's raising the bar right there. Yeah, it is. Putting us dads to shame. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. All right, take five. Question number one. You've been married almost 50 years. What is the best piece of marriage advice you can impart to our listeners? Love is not a hole you fall into. It's a choice you make. Amen. And um, commit. I wrote a blog post called the, the, the Shark Cage. You know, when you go down in the... Uh, 
and to see the great white shark, they put you in a cage and that cage is to protect you. And I think a lot of uh, marriage is about protecting each other mm -hmm. from what's coming at you from the outside. And it's, it, so it, it's commitment. I'd say number one is you just got to commit to it and stick with it. And if you do, it gets better and better and better. All the trivial stuff blows away over time and you end up being really committed and best friends and love each other, even the ugly parts. Hmm. Amen. That's good. Question number three, other than the suffocating heat down there, what do you love most about living in the South? Uh, it's these consistent world championship teams that are produced in our city. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like those ticker tape parades down Peachtree Street. Oh, boy. Well, I'm a Phillies fan, so I don't care for the Braves too much. <laughs> No, I, I, uh, I like the proximity to the water. We, uh, we're water people. We love the ocean, lakes, mountain streams. And uh, I don't know, some, somehow here we have clear seasons. Uh, so we get some cold, some not so cold, some wonderful springs and beautiful falls. But um, it's, it's just a good geography. Your, your neck of the woods is pretty nice too, though. I like the, I like the terrain up there. I've been there a few times and you just need more water. That's yeah. true. That's true. We do Amen. we do like it up here. All right. Question number four. What is one of your favorite childhood memories? Mm. Uh, coming back from vacation, <clears throat> uh, lying in the back seat of the car, uh, my head in my sister's lap, my feet in my brother's lap, my parents thinking I'm asleep, looking up between the front, the crack in the front seats and seeing my dad driving and watching the gauges and remembering how, how safe I felt mm -hmm. loved and safe because my dad was driving. Amen. Wow. That's really good. That's good stuff there. All right. Final question for take five. What's the best book you've read recently? Best book I've read what? Recently. <clears throat> John Ortberg, um, Eternity is Now in Session. You're the third or fourth person that has mentioned that book to me, so I'm going to write that down and remember it because <laughs> uh, other people have been telling me about that book as well. He has a great perspective on eternity, and uh, a lot of the book is about um, what salvation really is, and um, it's all you know scripturally based, and I don't... I, I found it a very impactful book. I, I, I find myself quoting it often. Hmm. So, yeah, it's a big big book for me. Awesome. Very cool. Well, that's it for Take 5, Reggie. We, uh, we'd we love, now that we've got the icebreaker out of the way, we'd love to kind of kind of dive into the interview and, and start by just hearing more about radical mentoring and kind of the story behind it, um, the beginnings of it, and what you guys are up to now. Well, I, uh, I kind of breezed past my conversion at, at 33, but I was... Uh, before Jesus got a hold of me, I mean, I was a church-going guy, but I was living a duplicitous life. Um, and and I, I mean, everything but hard drugs uh, and soft drugs, everything but drugs, I guess, I, I was probably guilty of. Hmm. Um, but when I surrendered to him, I, he gave me a heart of gratitude that has, to this day, um, hasn't waned at all. I... Uh, and so out of that gratitude, I just wanted everybody else to, to find and follow Jesus. So I started out kind of a radical evangelist. I was uh, witnessing to everybody in my family and basically making them all mad at me and <laughs> <clears throat> tried to do that at work and people quit. Um, but over time, I figured out that, you know, they got to know you care before they care to know. And I started mm -hmm. being more relational in that and um, and then we started working with singles in our church. And over the years, they they started calling me their mentor because more than anything else, I was just available. Uh, but but after um, kind of looking back and seeing that, <clears throat> I really wasn't seeing a lot of life change as a result of all that <clears throat> that time I was spending with those guys. Uh, and I, hear, I heard Tim Elmore say, more time with fewer people equals greater kingdom impact. And that sentence changed my life. And I said, you know, instead of trying to mentor 30 or 40 guys, you know, 
here and there in every coffee shop in Atlanta, I'm going to handpick a small group of guys and I'm going to pour into them for a period of time. And um, they're going to have, it's going to be a very high bar. I mean, I've been, I've run some companies and, and uh, I, nothing, nothing would frustrate me more than to prepare for a lesson and then have nobody show up or prepare for a small group and have three people show. And, 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 and so I said, if I'm going to do this, you know, you're going to be there, you're going to be there on time, or I'm just going to shame you, real, like really shame you. <laughs> and uh, so I came up with a covenant, and it said this is about Jesus and, and his way of life and the way of life he has for us. Um, if you want to embark on this, you've got to be at every meeting on time, and uh, you got to do your work. And uh, you got to be willing to take direct feedback, given in love. Uh, and at the end of it, and everything is said and done in the group is is confidential. But at the end of the day, you got to pay it forward. You have to invest in somebody else the way I'm going to invest in you. And so I, uh, I went through, you know, I, I really ran off the road between age 30 and 33. And I had two small children and I was worshiping the career God. I mean, it was, that's where I was. So my, my sweet spot was guys who were in their late 20s, early 30s with small kids who thought uh, conquering the world and making a lot of money was going to make them um, meaningful and fulfilled in their lives. And so I found uh, some guys that were willing to embark on the journey and we did a year and lives changed and God got some glory and I had eight more lined up and I did that for eight years. I just, uh, I picked the books that had impacted my life. Um, I didn't do Bible study. I, uh, I picked books that were topical, that were by very uh, solid, respected authors who had spent their lives studying and applying scriptures on that topic. And I just, uh, I, God gave me a memory verse or two for each topic. So guys that graduated from my group could quote 20 to 24 scriptures by topic. Wow. So rather than do deep dive on Bible study, I just had them commit scripture to their mind and heart by key word. And anyway, it just took off. And then about seven years into it, um, I wrote a book about it and after that, we started trying to take it to churches, and we now have about 270 churches who are um, who have embraced this, and we have about 1,300 mentors uh, and about uh, almost 10,000 men who've been mentored in churches all over the country and some in foreign countries. So that's that's kind of the story. That's incredible. Wow, well, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, so many times God uses the our experiences in our lives to, uh, you know, shape his kingdom. And that's obviously, uh, there's, there's proof in the pudding with that in, in your story uh, and, and, and your transformation and then giving back and, and, and paying it forward. And uh, now look what's happened. So props to you. That's amazing what uh, what God's done through all that. It, it is. And I mean, I'm not I'm not being, you know fake humble about this, but I do ask God sometimes, why did you pick me? Why did you give me this? Because um, there's so many people that could have done so much more with it, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in North Point and have been friends with Andy now for 25 years. And I look at what God's done through him with, you know, millions of people seeing his, seeing his teachings and following his, his uh, insights. And I look at my little prayer board and I got... 144 names of guys. That's it. 144 guys. Hmm. And then now God has taken radical mentoring and multiplied it out to, you know, almost 10,000 guys, which is none of my doing. Um, but it's still, you look at 340 million Americans and there's 10,000 guys who've been impacted. But, you know, Jesus started with 12, mm -hmm. well, 11. Yeah. Well, I guess 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's all God. It's not me, I promise. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, one of the things, uh, Reggie, that uh, I'm a huge fan of and a huge proponent uh, of is your your model of, um, uh, of, of handpicking disciples. But before we even get into that, um, I, I want to get into, you know, some people listening to this podcast um, – 
might say, well, why is Men of Iron having this radical mentoring on your podcast? Isn't that kind of counterintuitive? And, you know, the last thing that we want to do is um, have this idea that, oh, hey, walls up, you know, Reggie and his crew can do what they're doing and Men of Iron's going to do what they're doing. But I, I think we have this idea of, you know, I'm air quoting here, but, you know, rooting for rivals, if you will. Um, and collaborating and saying, listen, we're all doing the same work. How can we work together? And, and we're focused on the one-on-one, one-to-one -on -one, one -one mentorships and microgroup mentorships, and you're in the small group. Can you just give your perspective of why the small group mentorship setting works for radical mentoring? I think ultimately all, um, almost all of the life change that happens um, between a mentor and mentee happens one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. I think the group is a means to that end. Amen. What, uh, what's broken in relationship gets healed in relationship. Mm. And when men, uh, what, what Radical does is creates a very high trust community very fast, like three months in. Mm. And, uh, you know, People talk about, you know, the small group is a kitchen table. Life change happens on the back porch. Mm. It's when a guy gets up and goes goes to the back porch with a guy. So I don't think we compete at all. We just have a means to get to that one-on-one -on -one situation. And, and a lot of the one-on-one -on -one hap change happens with a mentor-mentee. Some of it happens between mentee and mentee. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could tell you a story that would just make you want to cry about one of the guys in my last group. Um, and, and in a crisis, he didn't call me. He called another mentee. Oh. And that guy spoke into his life and changed his family forever. Mm, I had nothing to do with it. So it, it's that, I don't know if that's too long or too short an answer. But no, that's good. I think we're, we're all getting to the transaction level, which is two men who love and trust each other. And one, maybe a little bit ahead, a couple of steps ahead in the journey, who is is trying to help the the younger one um, understand and interpret and respond to whatever is coming at him. I I told my daughter this this morning. She's she's got three little girls and she's she's having a crisis, uh, a silly, stupid woman crisis. <laughs> Uh, but you know parents are interpreters but parent parents they know the language of adolescence and adulthood and their kids that they're raising don't and so they're interpreting culture they're interpreting the the social mores and the pecking order of school and all that and that's all we do as mentors is we are interpreters we help we help our mentees differentiate between love and sex, for example. Mm -hmm. Helping a guy understand that because his wife doesn't want to have sex with him every day doesn't mean she doesn't love him. Mm -hmm. You know, she actually might actually have a life of her own and <laughs> she, she might want she might want to see a movie sometime or something. <laughs> That's good. I, I like that interpretation of, you know, or yeah. that analogy of that mentors are interpreters. That's, that's, uh, yeah. That's good. I'm not sure I've ever heard it that way. Uh, Reggie, talk to us a little bit about um, you're in your book. We're going to get to it a little bit later, but Mentor Like Jesus. Um, it was one of the biggest things I took away from your book was the the model of Jesus. And he, he handpicked his disciples. He was prayerful about that process. Uh, he intentionally sought these men out. He invited them into, number one, a relationship and into this journey. Um, talk to us about the purpose and idea behind, you know, a mentor intentionally reaching out to a protege and invite him in, into that mentorship. Why is that so significant? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, amuse myself by pushing ropes uphill. <clears throat> and uh, I've been in church world all my life, you know, early, early, middle and late. <clears throat> and it's always, please come, please come, please come. Uh, you don't have to come for all five sessions. Just come for as many as you can. Yada, yada. You know, it's all about cheeks in the seats. And Jesus did not do that, you know. Um, 
I, I believe Jesus was a multiplication strategy, not a, an addition strategy. People sought him. They followed him. They showed up in different places where he was. But I can't find anything in the scripture that said, hey, come, you know, please come to the temple on Sunday. I'm going to be there. See the posters in the post office. I mean, it's just not, that's not his style. And, and so, I mean, if I'm going to, if I only have a limited amount of time and energy and I want to focus it on someone or some ones, I want guys that are likely to replicate it and pay it forward. Mm -hmm. And I can't make a mass um, call <clears throat> and get those people. And that's just an addition strategy, not a multiplication strategy. Uh, and I've picked some wrong guys. Um, I, I, I picked some guys that were just not spiritually ready. Um, they, they grew some, but the more I've done this, the more I've, I've tried to poke, uh, focus on guys who have potential. The, the higher potential, the hungrier they are. The last thing you want to do as a mentor is to be begging somebody to show up. Amen. Begging somebody to do the work. If you're not hungry, then God bless you. I mean, you're a disciple, I hope. And I hope you're going to make a difference in your life and your family, but I, I don't have time. I don't have enough bandwidth or time to spread myself amongst a thousand guys and hope that I'm going to get a hundred who really get it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on the hundred as best I can pick them. And I think that's biblical. I mean, there was a standard that, that Jesus had for his disciples and that standard was very, very, very high. I mean, Absolutely. it was either come follow me or you're out, you know? And, and I think that that's what, Maybe if, if I could just mention this, and Steve, you know this too, but in our work with the church, and when I say the church, I mean the church in general, is um, it, it, it does try to be an all-inclusive environment sometimes, and I, th I think there's a place for that, but when it comes to uh, the spiritual formation of people, they either have to be in or not, and, and I think that Jesus did a really... Uh, great job at that. It was just like, listen, you got to leave. Yeah, in some cases, these guys had to leave their families, their jobs, everything that they were comfortable with to go and follow him. And um, I think it's okay for us in, in ministry, and it's okay as we approach these mentoring relationships and discipleship relationships, that it's okay to set the standard because I believe in the gut deep down inside of every man, he may not be ready for it at all times, but there is going to come a time in every man, they have this deep desire in their gut to step up to a challenge mm -hmm. and, and they want that and they desire that. And so um, at least that's been my experience in mentorships is uh, when, when a mentor really challenged me, I either responded or I didn't, there's nothing in between, you know? And so I think that that uh, kind of goes right into the model. Two of my, two of my best uh, success stories were guys that were turned down the first time they applied. Hmm. Wow. And they came back again a second year and they were ready and different years, but they applied the second time and then they, they, they were ready for the group. So yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'd love to see some statistics about um, how many people were a part of the Jewish temple in Jesus day. Mm. Um, you know, would you say it's probably a, a million people total or yeah, say 500,000? I mean, pick a number. The biggest crowd Jesus ever drew was 5,000, right? Yep. So he was like 1% of the established church. Mm. And, and, and of course, his disciples were hoping he'd take it over, right? Which is what we'd love to, we'd like take over everything because mm -hmm. we'd make it all better. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus was, it was, it was about, it was about being on purpose and his, that was his model and. I don't think we can ever uh, beat his model. I really don't. Yeah, yeah. What? Um, talk to us just a little bit about, and, and we can speak into this a little bit too, but uh, mentoring men is not an easy thing. Discipleship, mentorship in general is not an easy thing. And I think you add another element to it when you're, <laughs> when you're dealing with men. Um, talk to us about what you guys have found and what you personally have found when it comes to the challenges um, of mentoring men. Well, I, I think a lot, I mean, you win the championship in the draft. And so the very, the first one is for mentors to be, to be called to this, to be motivated to do it for the right reasons. 
Um, if you're trying to be a mentor because you, you, you think it sounds good or uh, makes you more respected in your church or your community, or if you're looking for potential recruits for your uh, for your uh, multi-level marketing organization, or you know, any of those reasons are the wrong reasons to mentor. So I think the heart of the mentor is is is, is the first thing. You got to have a guy who really loves other people. Every every month before my meeting, I say, I pray and I say, Lord, what would you have me know about tonight? And every month the same message comes through. Reggie, just love them. Mm-hmm. If you don't love younger men or men that you that you are pouring into, you know, you can't minister to somebody you don't love. So if you don't authentically love these guys, it's got it's going nowhere. Mm-hmm. So that's that's number one. And, and the only love that's real is love that's demonstrated. So that means you, you're opening up your heart. You're telling them your ugly stuff. You're opening up your network to them. You're, uh, you know, not no holds barred. I mean, it's like I'm, I'm just gonna. Everything I have is is available to you because I love you and I want for you <clears throat> this flourishing relationship with Jesus, with your wife, with your kids, with your church. So that's 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 kind of number one. Number two is is to not get carried away with content. Mm. The world is overflowing with content and you know i can get content anywhere from you know anywhere anytime but i can't get an older man who really cares about me oh man that's so good (laughs) who will you know there's a big difference between love and acceptance you know paul thorne has a song so i don't i don't like everybody i love (laughs) Mm. you gotta choose you gotta choose to like people that aren't like you and, um, and, and when you do that and you, you, you let them feel that acceptance, you know, people are drawn to environments of acceptance and they run from environments of rejection. And we can love the very people that we reject at, you know, in a biblical way. But if we don't accept them and like them and communicate, hey, look, I'm with you, I'm for you, then you know, we don't have a whole lot of influence on, on, on them with whatever it is we're, we're trying to convey. So <clears throat> given the choice, most, most groups uh, and a lot of mentoring is 80% content and 20% relationship. Mm. And what Radical has attempted to do is to create environments where it's 80% relationship and 20% content. So good, man. So good. I was just just telling somebody this the other night that, um, you know, I, I started a, a micro group this year and, and one's uh, one of the guys is a longtime childhood friend of mine. And the other one is my barber, believe it or not. And we meet every other Monday night. And, um, you know, we started and, and these guys weren't, you know, going to church and they weren't in the word. And, you know, they, they probably were both in a position or in a place where they were seeking, but they just... They were hungry, but they, they weren't doing anything with it. And so uh, literally it was just an encouragement to get into God's word. Mm-hmm. And it was an encouragement to uh, start taking their families to church. Right. And um, literally all I did was just say, hey, why don't we read the Bible together a little bit? And and so we started reading through the Gospels and then we would meet and we talk about it. And, and literally I, I, I looked around at our staff and I've been telling them like, like, we could put out the best content in the world, but at the end of the day, it's going to take a man to meet these guys face to face. And like you said, Reggie, love them, show them God's love, show them the word, teach them a little thing here and there, right? But it's about showing up and meeting them where they are. And, and I can tell you in 90 days, these guys have you know accepted Christ. They've been baptized. They're taking their families to church. And it's not by any sort of content that's out there that, that showed, showed us what to do. It was literally just meet with them every other week and, and meeting them right where they were and having those conversations. That's so good. It's, it's all about the relationship. I can't, can't agree more. Yeah. Well, hey, you wrote a book, and, and we want to get into this a little bit, but um, called Mentoring Like Jesus. And um, we're going to share a link to, for our listeners and viewers to, to purchase that book. I really highly recommend it. Tell us a little bit more about um, – the book and, and what you've learned about mentoring the way that Jesus did. It. Well, uh, I had done this for, uh, I guess, six years, maybe seven years. And um, literally, I was awakened in the middle of the night. 
And the thought in my head was, we, you're just doing what Jesus did. Mm. And I think I was 57 at the time. And uh, so at 57, you wake up at 3 in the morning. First thing you do is go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I made that stop, and then I went to my computer. And I said, okay, what did Jesus do? And literally, it, the book was outlined in 15 minutes. And, and it, it was like, retrospectively, I realized that what I had been doing was what Jesus did. He, you know, he was on purpose. I have a life purpose statement that is to glorify God by loving and serving others and by challenging them hmm. to engage in the overwhelming love of God. And so here I, I had been loving and serving and challenging these guys. Um, Jesus handpicked his guys. It was a very high level of commitment, which our covenant uh, you know, requires. It was all about Jesus and his teachings and his way of life. Uh, it was along the way. It was not um, uh, some hypothetical stuff. He used issues and real-time decisions to teach his guys who he was and how he thought and, and how to live his way. And it was a multiplication, not addition. And so all of the, the the chapters in the book were really those things that I had I had been doing, but not knowing at the time that I had I had uh, had had been emulating Jesus and what I did. So uh, put it in a book, and it's become uh, it's become a, a pretty pretty widespread um, uh, tool to help people understand at least this this approach to Jesus mentoring. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to get to this last question, Steve, and then you know, want to open it up for any other questions. But why, why, Reggie, aren't more men, more Christian men, I should say, why aren't more Christian men mentoring and being mentored? Well, I think uh, overwhelmingly most of the men I interact with don't feel like they're good enough. Hmm. And, and um, it's like, I don't, what would I do? What would I say? And, um, and and that's that's the devil's lie. I mean, we've it, it, our our website, which everything on it is free, gives. I mean, down to almost read this, ask this question, <laughs> um, down to Bible study fellowship kind of detail of how um, how to orchestrate a meeting. So we've taken the. I don't know how out of it, and I'm sure you guys have in your content as well. Uh, the other thing that that I see is the biggest resistance is I don't have time. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And when when I surrendered to Christ in uh, when I was 33, my senior, my pastor came to visit the next week, and he invited me into a small group um, discipleship thing. And me and my wife uh, it was called Master Life. And, of course, I started backpedaling, and I said, well, you know, I, I moved to Atlanta. I got this new job, and I, and I travel a lot, and I don't know that I could be there 13 consecutive Tuesday nights. And he looked at me, and he, he, he paused, and he said, well, Reggie, sooner or later, sooner or later you're going to have to decide what's most important. Hmm. 33 years old, I had never, ever, ever been challenged. Hmm in any way with a question like that. And you know what? God's blessing waits on the other side of obedience. Mm, amen. And I walked away from that conversation. I said, sign us up. And you know what? We were there every Tuesday night. Miraculously, I would travel almost everything I did ended up being scheduled on Thursday or Wednesday. I never missed a meeting and that changed my life. And then I started leading those groups and, so on and so forth. So the, it's a devil's lie that you don't have time. We all have 24 hours a day. It's mm -hmm. a matter of what you do with them. And um, so that's my answer. Well, one of Garrett's favorite, favorite phrases, I hear it all the time, is you make, you make time for things that are important to you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's so good right there, Steve. That's a good word. Hey, I learned it from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, Reggie, we uh, are just so grateful for this opportunity to speak with you. And uh, as I said to you before we went live here, uh, I've been following you guys from a distance for quite a while. And um, man, I just, I'm all for collaborative partnerships. Men of Iron is all for collaborative partnerships. And we're going to make it a priority to get down there and, and see you guys and visit with your team and, and start finding out you know, how we can work together. Cause like you said beforehand, there's, there's plenty of ways we're all doing the same things. We all have the, uh, the, the same purpose here and, and similar missions. And it's just about, uh, you know, doing it in slightly different ways, but it's all for the end goal. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to, we'd love to have you and love to engage in that conversation. And, uh, you know, just, you know, for, for the guys that are, are listening to this, that want to, uh, uh, want to read some of the content that we put together. Uh, there's a, a, our website is radicalmentoring.com forward slash blog. Uh, I write two pieces each week and uh, that's been put together into a book that was released about, I guess, seven or eight months ago called Radical Wisdom, mm. uh, which is a daily devotional for leaders. And um, that can be found at Amazon or on our website. So, we just love men and we love Jesus and we mm. think that the two of them need to get together. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. We thank you so much for your time, Reggie. You can go to RadicalMentoring.com to find out more about Reggie and what these guys are up to down there. And, and I know I sign up for the email blast, so you get you get those blogs that you write two times a week right into your email. So That's good. There's go no excuse to miss them then, Steve. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Reggie. We really appreciate it. We look forward to connecting with you here in the near future. Thanks, guys. Yeah. God bless. God uh, speed in all you do. Thank right, you. Thanks, we'll Reggie. Soon. Take care. Take care. Awesome. Well, thank you again to Reggie from Radical Mentoring. Man, we are we are just excited about that interview. Yeah, he's he's such a good dude, and uh, I really do believe in what they're doing. And for those of you that are listening and watching, I mean, we, we were speaking before the show went live, and, and he said, listen, um, we, need to, we need to find a one-to-one -one track and a mm -hmm. microgroup track because he said – you know, so many guys that go through, um, you know, the radical mentoring, small group mentorship, for example, he said of eight guys, you might only have two yeah. uh, on average that can go on to lead a small group in the future. And he said, but the problem is those other five, six guys, they're completely capable of leading another guy yep. one to one or a micro group. And so um, man, that's where I just think there's so much potential for yeah. collaboration with radical mentoring. And if you're out there and you're listening, man, we are for these guys. We yeah, love what definitely. they're doing. Uh, you just got to kind of find out what, what, you know, uh, fuels you up if it's to do the one-to-one -one micro group or, or, or small group, but, but man, we are behind these guys and I believe wholeheartedly in what they're doing. I've seen their stuff and, and they're right. They are so much, so heavy in the relational side. Uh, you're not going to find a ton of content, yep. um, but but they they give the content that they recommend, and I think that they're that's why they've been so successful. Yep. That's why Reggie and his team have been so successful is because they understand the significance uh, of the relational component. And there's there's so much content out there. It's at the end of the day, it's about meeting a man where he's at, pouring into him, yep. loving on him, and, and making that a priority. Amen. Thank you, Reggie, for joining us, man. That was awesome stuff. For more info on the Men of Iron podcast, go to menofiron.org backslash podcast, and you can be the next sponsor for the Men of Iron podcast. You listening right now. Yeah. You. Yeah, write a check. Make it happen. <laughs> Are you going to invest or not? So menofiron.org backslash sponsor to find out more info. We would love to connect with you guys and, and get you on here as our next sponsor. That's it. Episode 40. We are out. See you, Stevie. Peace.